Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Dear viewers, today we are going to talk about a, a very important topic, and that happens to be the dangers of radicalization and extremism in the name of Khilafa. So, Khilafa, if you were to define it, it is the succession. The word Khilafa means succession. Uh, succession of the rule which came after the prophetic rule. You know, when the Prophet وسلم, he was um, implementing the Islamic law based on the Quran and the Sunnah, when the Prophet وسلم, when he was implementing the law of the Quran on a people, on a land, and that became the rule of uh, you know the Islamic, uh, you know the Islamic law based on um, what Allah had revealed. Now, soon after the Prophet's times, there were the companions of the Prophet ﷺ who carried forward the application of the Islamic law on the Muslim lands, and that was the Caliphate, and that was the the Khilafah. And there was uh, soon after the times of the companions. The, there were the Umayya uh, Khilafa and then there were the Abbasi Khilafa and to recent times it was the Usmani Khilafa. So what we can understand is that there was a time where people ruled by the Quran and that is something which is noble. There is no two opinions about it. But what's happening here in today's times is that People cite some references from the Quran, from the Sunnah, from the life of the Sahaba and they apply it in a wrong manner. They apply it in a way that can cause more harm than good. So that's what we're going to discuss here. What is the harm? The harm would be that people who are not worthy to be talking on subjects which are beyond their scope, when they take up you know responsibilities to deal with the issues of the uh, you know issues of the state and issues of uh, uh, ruling the people then they create more chaos than good and that is what is expected of and that is what has been happening since few years and that's what i'm going to touch upon see the youths how they have been uh, radicalized and and sent into one corner of extremism they are being told that the Muslim rulers, they are being told that the Muslim rulers today, whoever are living on earth, according to their version, according to their narrative, they say that the Muslim rulers of the world today, they all are apostates. That's what they say. They say that they have gone outside the fold of Islam. That's what they say, which I deny, which I deny outrightly I totally deny that totally I totally deny that claim you know what they say they say that they are not ruling by the Quran and they're not ruling by the book of Allah and therefore according to them they say that these people have gone outside of the fold of Islam so according to them these 50 plus Muslim countries they are not living under a Muslim ruler and therefore according to them these people, no, these rulers, according to them, they have to be ousted. They have to be taken out of the power. And according to them, they want to bring back Khilafah, wherein they want to unite all the countries under one ruler. Now, the, the thing is, it's so nice to hear, but then if you want to try to understand the demography of today, how the world is and how the situations are and how the Muslims are living today, how they have differences of opinions within their circles. There's so much of Aqaid, the differences in creed, the differences in languages, the differences in cultures and so many things. And people, you won't believe, people don't want to take one person as a leader for one particular city even. You won't believe in many countries, they don't want to take one person among the Muslims 
to be a leader for the entire group of Muslims because they have different one group is from Sunni other group is from Shia then among the Sunni there are so many groups one say they are Baralvi then the Diobandi then there is Ahle Hadith and so many groups and again there is uh, among the Shia there are so many groups and they don't want to themselves be united under one ruler it's simple even in a city and if you can't bring that within a city and you claiming that you want to bring it across the whole world at once you see that is too far too far by saying this i don't say that khilafa will not come i believe as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that there will be you know khilafa ala minhajin nubuwa you know the khilafa ala minhajin nubuwa means there would be uh, Khilafah according to the uh, prophetic uh, teachings that was there during the times of the Sahaba it was there and that was continuing for some 30 years according to the Hadith and then thereafter there were rulers who also came according to the Prophet Sallallahu he said there will be rulers who would come and they would be ruling and uh, there will be military rule after that that is also was prophesied by the prophet sallallahu and they will be ruling and after all of that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said towards the end of times towards the end of times again the khilafa would come back upon the prophetic way uh, so now what we say yes that is going to happen but when it is happened we'll see but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not say that these rulers whoever will be in between the times of the two Khilafas, the Prophet ﷺ did not say all those are apostates. He did not, he did not say that all the people who are living under them have, have gone outside the fold of Islam. That was not said. But the narrative which has been given today to the youths is that they are being told, they are being brainwashed to believe that the rulers have apostated and that the people who are living there they are also outside the fold of Islam until they are not completely working for the cause of bringing the Khilafah. This is what they say. What I'm trying to trying to understand is that because of this kind of understanding, what has happened, a lot of people, when they heard that ISIS, you know, ISIS, the deviant group in the world today, the most deviant group in the world today, who is totally been, you know, denied. No, the ISIS is totally been denied by the Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama. The scholars of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama consider them to be deviants, and they they are being told that they are from the Khawarij, the people from a deviant group, or they are being told they are working under the people like Abdullah bin Sabah. No, Abdullah bin Sabah was a person who claimed to be Muslim, but then he was a munafik, a munafik who was under the garb of being a Muslim, he created turmoil in the Muslim world. And same kind of people are most likely behind ISIS. So what happened when ISIS declared that they are the Khilafah, then a lot of people who are given this understanding of, you know, considering that going and working under a Khalifa is noble, and all of most of the people who were naive, they just went there and they joined you won't believe, you won't believe, it is recorded, it is recorded, all these things are part of the history. Even from Bangalore, from, from Bangalore, this has come in the paper, even from the Bangalore, from a very noble family, a person had gone all the way to Syria and he got killed there. Now, what kind of thing has worked on his mind? Can you imagine what is really going through the minds of such youths? You can understand, you can understand there's something going wrong. And that should not continue. That's why we are talking about this. You might wonder why is that Umar Sharif is talking about these topics? Can't he be just relaxing, you know, talking about other issues? Yes, I would love to talk about other issues. These these are not the topics that I would like to talk. But the thing is, the issue is so alarming. I'm really worried. I'm really worried about the youths. I don't want the youths to get misled. I'll tell you very simple how to get rid of all these extremism. Just stick to your local Jamaat. Stick to your local scholars. Understanding of the local Jamaats and organizations. You will not go astray, inshallah. Because the Jamaat is very important. You stick to the Jamaat. First, you are primarily your Jamaat around you. Okay? And 
don't get misled by somebody who is sending you some messages from the uh, overseas, he's sending some mails and, and through the uh, internet you try to understand some concepts and you apply, it's totally misleading, my dear brothers and sisters, we are not to do that. So now I'm going to reason with them, I'm going to reason with them, how this is not right. Look, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he saw the Muslims being oppressed in Mecca, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not fighting against the disbelievers who were persecuting the Muslims, who were oppressing the Muslims. The Muslims were, you know, forbearing the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of torture, the kind of, um, you know, harshness which was being seen by the uh, disbelievers in Mecca. And the Prophet Wasallam, at that point in time, he asked the believers to migrate to Abyssinia. Almost 80 members, they went, yeah, 80 members, they went to Abyssinia under the leadership of uh, Ja'far bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet sallallahu asked the companions to go there as muhajirs, as muhajirun, as uh, immigrants to a Christian land which was ruled by the king called Negus. And Arabic name is Najashi. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told uh, Ja'far bin Abi Talib that he is a good, just ruler. You be under him and he will take care of you. And that's how the Sahaba went migrating to the land of the Christians, which was ruled by a Christian by the name Najashi. And the point here is, if, 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 if we were to say that it is haram for anybody to live under the un-Islamic uh, ruling or un-Islamic regime or leadership or rulership, then why did the Prophet ﷺ send a delegation or the members of 80 members as Muhajirun to Abyssinia? This is the first question. But now you might say there was no Islamic State then, that's the reason the Prophet ﷺ sent you. You might, say, you might hear this kind of arguments, you know. People might come and say, yeah, but that happened when Medina was not there. That happened when Islamic State was not established. That's what the counter argument would be. Look at this, look at this, what is coming, following through. When the Prophet ﷺ, he established an Islamic State in Medina. If you happen to read the Medina Declaration, you'll come to know the Prophet ﷺ had peace treaties with the non-Muslims in Medina. So much so that he said, Oh Jewish tribes, when we are being attacked, you will have to stand up for us. And when you are being attacked, we will stand up for you and we'll be like one body. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. Why did the Prophet ﷺ make such treaties if it is said that only the land is for only the Muslims? No, he had peace treaties with the Jews. And what happened thereafter? There were so many uh, incidents wherein the Jews, some of the Jewish tribes, they backstabbed the believers. Uh, in the, during the time of the Battle of Khandak and uh, many other situations, the Jews, they, they betrayed the Muslims and they went and got settled in Khaybar. We know this, this what happened in Khaybar. They were staying in Khaybar and they were making so many other unwanted uh, problems for the Muslims. And uh, when the Prophet ﷺ, he went to perform Umrah, the disbelievers uh, from Makkah, they stopped the Prophet ﷺ and Sahaba. And what happened thereafter was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. What is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah? It's a treaty with the disbelievers amongst the idolaters of Makkah. Is it clear? When an Islamic state is already established in Medina, yet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was willing to have a peace treaty with the disbelievers of Makkah. So what does this say? According to these people who are promoting this deviant thought, they are supposed to say that the Islamic State has been established, so they have to just go on conquering and conquering according to them. But what did the Prophet ﷺ show as example? He has a peace treaty for a period of 10 years that there should be no fightings. Can you understand the magnanimity of the Prophet ﷺ? And what happens thereafter? The Prophet ﷺ goes to Khaybar. Because the people in Khaybar were the Jews 
who were wanting to attack the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ went and attacked them. Now what I'm trying to say, the Khaybar incident, the, the, the attack on Khaybar, Khaybar was captured in uh, 6th century of Hijri calendar. Okay, 6th century of the Hijri calendar. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Sixth year of the Hijri calendar. I'm sorry. Not the sixth century. Sixth year of the Hijri calendar. The Khyber happened. Okay, the uh, the capturing of the Khyber happened. Now, the point that I want to say, I had told you that 80 members from among the Sahaba, they had gone to Abyssinia to live under Najashi, the Christian monk. Uh, I'm sorry, the Christian ruler. Okay, the Christian ruler. You know, when they come back to Medina, the Islamic State, after the Khyber was captured, they come back to Medina, the Islamic State. If the Prophet you know, wanted to say that, you know, uh, that the Muslims must not stay in any land other than the Muslim land, then he would have commanded the Muhajirun in Abyssinia to come to Medina from the day one when the Islamic State was established. But the Prophet ﷺ did not do that. The Prophet ﷺ let the believers stay in a non-Muslim country. This is what I'm trying to say. A Muslim can live in a non-Muslim country and it's totally halal for him and his deen is intact. It doesn't make him a disbeliever. Now the thing is, my dear youths, try to understand. Even when the Prophet ﷺ made the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, do you know that in Makkah there were a lot of Muslims who did not reveal their identity and they were living in Makkah as Muslims. Even at the time when the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was done, until the Fateh Makkah, there were a lot of Muslims who were living in Makkah under the non-Muslim rule. The Prophet ﷺ did not say you will have to come to Medina and we have established an Islamic nation. He did not say that. So now, whatever is being said in the name of Khilafah, Khilafah is noble, no two opinions. Brothers, we are not against the word Khilafah. We believe that Islamic law is the best law. There is nothing else which can be equal to the Islamic law. And Islamic law has to be applied by those who are in authority. You and I who don't have authority, we can't apply the Islamic law on a total number of people because you and I, we don't rule a land. But for the rulers who are ruling the lands, it is for them to apply. And even in that kind of situation, they are supposed to live in amicable situation with the non-Muslims of their lands and with the non-Muslims of their neighboring territories also. This is what Islam is teaching. If you have some other version, then I don't know from where you taking your knowledge. Some people might quote some of the incidents which happened during the times of the 7th century uh, of uh, Hijri or 8th century during the times of some of the scholars who said that you know that uh, you have to rule by the book of Allah and all of the see they were talking when they were living under the Islamic rule uh, you can't take one statement of a scholar and generalize it everything has got a reason everything has got the condition with which they were speaking so you can't just cite something from the 6th century and 7th century and say like this is the total statement which which has been given by this scholar for all times for all people no you can't do that people who study fiqh you know and you know you must be knowing better i can't say much but these are all the things which i've learned from the scholars so what is that i'm trying to say my dear brothers you can live under the non-muslim state you will not be accounted for the rulings that they do as long as you are practicing the obligations of the deen you can just be at peace, do, you can do dawa, communicate to the people. If you're being oppressed, you either um, migrate to a place where there's no oppression or if you're strong enough to defend yourself, you defend yourself with strength. You understand if you're being oppressed, but if you can't, then just stay calm and don't create any kind of uprising or rebel in your land. If you're doing that, you're going to cause more harm. There's going to be more harm than more good. Look, there were times when um, the um, 
Muslims in Kerala, they were ruling, you know, they were living in uh, Kerala, like during the times of the Prophet itself, 628 CE, there was this chairman Perumal who came from India to meet the Prophet Sallallahu He embraced Islam and on the way to uh, Kerala, he died, he died. And um, a lot of people amongst the people in India, they had become Muslims because the king had embraced Islam. These people were not living in Saudi or they did not migrate to Saudi or I'm sorry, they did not migrate to Arab uh, countries or they did not migrate to Makkah or Madina. They were, they were living in, uh, in India itself and their religion was totally complete. We cannot say just because they did not come under the Khilafah, they were um, disbelievers. No, you can't say that. So today, if you're thinking that living in a land where Islam is not been applied is dangerous for your deen, it, you should not think in that way. You should not think in that way. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so now, finally, I just want to clear up the air. Look, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which says very clearly, Man ra'a minkum munkaran fal yugayyirhu biyadihi fa illam yastati fa bi lisanihi fa illam yastati fa bi qalbihi. Dalika adha'aful iman. The hadith says, Whosoever sees an evil, let him stop it by his hand. If he cannot, let him stop it by his tongue. If he cannot, let him feel that he's wrong in his heart. And that is the lowest of the Iman. Now, to stop it with the hand is for the person who has got strength and authority. You and I who don't have authority on land, we cannot say that I want to stop the evil. I want to close the wine shops. And you cannot say I want to close all the brothels and go on uh, going on, um, you know, attacking the um, brothels and uh, what do you call wine stalls and taking law in your hand. You cannot do that. It is for the authority. If you have the authority in land, then you can. Otherwise, no, it is the state which has to take authority. If you are taking authority in your hand based on this hadith saying that I am also, you know, um, uh, given the uh, freedom to do that. No, you are totally wrong. You haven't understood this right way. Because the this I've heard from a scholar who has very clearly explained that this, for a person who has authority, he has to stop the evil by his hand. Otherwise, no. And there is another uh, verse of the Quran which the people very, very easily they quote. They say, مَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ They say, this is a Quran. Is the Quran's ayat from Surah Al Maida. It says, Whosoever rules by the book of Allah, he has become a kafir. They say that. They say that. But now, recently, I've heard from a scholar, very beautiful explanation. He says, is also there in that surah. There are even other two surahs which says, is also there. Uh, Fasik means a uh, person who is disobedient. Again, there's another verse which says, Fawulaika humu zalimun, a person who is a transgressor. And uh, there's a verse which says, Fawulaika humul kafirun. You cannot call all of them whoever is not ruling by the book of Allah to be a kafir, first thing, because there are even Fasiks and there are also zalims. This is explained by one of the Saudi scholars. I don't want to mention some of the scholars' names because the moment I say some of them would start, uh, you know, people who don't agree to these things, they would start making some uh, disparaging comments against them. So I don't want to do this. Inshallah, I can, inshallah, we can share all the uh, references in the coming days, inshallah. So what I want to leave you with is that you cannot say at once that a person has become a kafir or an apostate just like that you cannot do that and uh, i would say uh, before leaving i just want to leave you with some nasiha let your leaders of your you know, city or your village or your country decide for us we have the elders the scholars are there in india there are leaders who are politically connected we are there to uh, sit with them and understand what is right and what is wrong and to do what is right and what is wrong we don't want any Bacha, you know, bacha, chota, chota, bacha, who doesn't have any um, scholarly knowledge and who don't have any kuwa on land. We don't want these kind of bachas to interfere in these matters. And these guys, they cannot get away from me, inshallah. Ta'ala. <laughs> in Bangalore, at least. Uh, for India, the whole of India is a different issue. Allah knows best. These guys who are trying to promote hatred and who are trying to promote extremism who are trying to promote radicalism amongst the youths believe me 
you cannot play this game for too long inshallah ta'ala you cannot play play this game for too long we will bring you to account very soon inshallah ta'ala we will bring you to account very soon inshallah either legally or through the jamaats you will be brought into account inshallah ta'ala because of your actions we don't want peace and harmony to be disrupted in india so based on that we will take very stern action you might wonder what's running in your mind but keep wondering so you bachas trying to act too smart you'll be brought into account very soon keep waiting so by saying this i would say one last thing do not get disconnected by the scholars of your village or your country be uh, with them stick to them learn the um, uh, basic knowledge about islam and again stick to the uh, local jamaat and try to uh, be connected to the uh, unity of the umma and don't think that somebody from outside of your village or your country will come and liberate you at once no these guys whoever is talking about these movements let me tell you one thing they don't even own single inch on this land which they rule they don't even rule one inch of land in the entire world today and they are talking great things believe me that is not going to happen and allah knows best allah knows best if something happens to them it's allah's will but based on what's happening and what we see today i don't see that happening i don't see that happening you have to be with the jama be with the member the ulama the scholars and try to advise the rulers if you can if not be there and maintain silence or if you can if you think that somebody is oppressing you your rights have been snatched you can migrate be in some other place where you have peace but don't create unwanted problems for anybody who is in your country with this i'm going to leave wa khairu da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin assalamu alaykum wa